do we ever do without cell phones? I just love having the freedom to go somewhere and get things done. But I gotta be honest with you. This just isn't working for me anymore. <laughs> it's, it's time for an upgrade. Could, could we trade up? I appreciate that, thank you very much. Now that's more like it. See, with a modern, with a modern smartphone, now you can spend more time with your family, you can live in a nice quiet place, you can interact with people all over the world. But you really can't, can you? You see, at some point, efficient transportation is still a necessary technology. <clears throat> Today we can video call and virtual conference and we can live stream over the internet. But there is one thing you're aware of if you live in a nice environment like this one, and that is that there is no such thing as a time efficient, on demand, low cost means of traveling with your family or small business team over regional distances. Either you can pile the kids in the car and drive for days, or you can get on an airplane and go 500 miles the exact opposite direction, change planes and go maybe where you want to go, maybe not. Do these options take away your time? Are they convenient for you? Are they comfortable? I think not. I have four kids and two of the teenagers at home still. And the other night we were talking about how it was that we liked to go to this place. We loved it when we went to that place. And the younger one said, we've never been there. <laughs> now, we're not made of money, but really, do, how long do we tolerate or avoid the high cost of going somewhere together? It's just way too expensive. But it, it's not just the time. It's the expedition cost, if you will. Okay? Drive all day and then you pay. But I think that if we had a brilliant solution to this problem, that it would raise a lot of societal issues. You see, NASA studies have revealed that when you have on-demand regional transportation, it takes the pressure off of the cities and off the crowded highways. It eases this crowded airport problem. And what's more, when we have fast, affordable, and convenient transportation, people don't feel the same pressure to bring everything that's out there right here. It's a win-win on multiple levels. But people can't fix what we don't see. And in studying this problem, it's clear that we don't see at least three of the contributing factors that have conspired to conceal this from our viewpoint. And I'd like to talk about two of them today and propose a potential solution. Now, if you live outside of an urban center, can you even imagine not having personal transportation? Maybe you and two and 300 of your closest friends would have the privilege of going to scheduled destinations on someone else's time for a small fee. After we see to your security, <laughs> not very appealing, is it? We get used to things like this, but I'm not sure we should have. Cities are really a response to a, a lack of mobility, aren't they? So only you know, a tycoon at one point could afford an early cell phone. But you already know the rest of the story. Seven billion cell phones. 30 years of developmental focus can bring unimaginable results. But neglect and apathy can lead to mistakes in the stewardship of technology. Worst of all, when we get complacent, when things are good enough, we can find ourselves trapped by regulation and predation with intermediate product forms that don't begin to deliver their full potential. 
And I believe that is what happened to the most promising solution of all, general aviation. The idea that once upon a time we could fly anywhere we want to. Our grandparents had no doubt that we'd be all zipping along by now on our own little personal flying machines. But it didn't happen in their lifetime or their children's lifetime. The question is, will it happen in ours? There are many who people would say, no way. You know, people use these ancient examples of hardware because that's all they've got. Noisy, cramped gas guzzlers. But if you happen to have $400,000 lying around, this is still one of the better choices that you have on the market. So it's safe to say that none of you here today probably want to buy an airplane. The small airplane for travel concept didn't really work out for the masses. So instead we get the regional system where you hop from place to place. Hub and spoke flying bus system that uses just 2% of our airports. But did you know that there are actually 19,700 airports and they're everywhere? Pristine destinations, quiet locations, Hundreds of thousands of small airplanes fly in and out of these all the time. And if you have your own airplane, well then you know what I'm talking about. The slipping the, sur the surly bonds of the earth, right? The glorious freedom of flight. The sheer joy of busting out hundred dollar bills by the stack. <laughs> Ask any pilot what makes an airplane fly and they'll quickly explain the physics. Money makes an airplane fly. <laughs> you get one half your roll per V squared or something like that. Flying started out expensive but it never got any better. It used to be that an airplane cost half as much as a house. Now it costs twice as much as a house. Manufacturers never prioritize non-pilots. So airplanes never evolved to meet the needs of non-pilots. But that was never a given. Why? Because driving is insane. Millions of people hurtle themselves along, skillfully avoiding death by mere inches, except for the 90 or so who won't succeed today. But don't forget there was a time when the consensus was that we could no more develop quiet, comfortable, affordable flying machines than we could go to the moon. Well, we went to the moon. And we did it with elegantly programmed 70 pound computers that had a whopping 64 thousand um, bytes of memory. 0 0.043 megahertz. But don't take me wrong. I stand here in admiration and amazement that all of these airplanes you see at a small airport were designed by brilliant, dedicated men using slide rules and graph paper. See, today we've already packaged the necessary technology to manage, fly, navigate, and emergency land an airplane on an average phone. We could be, instead of launching birds at pigs, we could be doing something like this, making universal iPlanes for the freedom to empower and mobilize the next generation. We didn't have the power to do it back then, but we do now. The seed of innovation never goes away. It flowers and blooms when it rains, and the rains, they're coming. Now, when you've got an ability to go from your little grass strip to grandma's local airfield anytime you want, you'll do that. But if it were profitable to do this, it would already have been done. But it is not. Yet no one seems to be asking why. Shouldn't that be the highest priority? It isn't the obvious thing of, well, nobody buys them, not many are sold, that sort of thing. If you only sold 5,000 smartphones a year, they'd be monumentally expensive too. But that's not the problem. The problem is actually that powered airplanes in the 200 to 400 mile per hour speed range 
just use way too much energy when they fly. It's because the air swirls when we push on it, and we didn't properly account for that. So it's an economic problem on the surface, but it's camouflage for an aerodynamic mistake that has created a colossal, terrible passenger experience. So here's how it works out. Mathematically, fluids should not offer any drag resistance to an object, but obviously they do. It's called D'Alembert's paradox. And in the early 1900s, Ludwig Prandtl figured out a way to use the kinetic energy equation. It depends on a simple assumption that's a reasonable assumption, a close approximation to the truth, especially for the kind of flying that we did back then. Except that by 1950, aerodynamicist Gabrielli and von Karman noticed something rather striking. We seem to know how to move objects on a fuel efficient basis at high speeds and at low speeds. But everything in the middle is way behind the curve. Now today, four seconds on a laptop can deliver more data than a month of wind tunnel studies. But we have to be careful. Are we using simplifications or the advanced mathematics of nature? Today, we've actually crossed the Gabrielli von Karman limit with airplanes like the uh, Concorde and the 747. But in the speed range between the speed of a supercar and a jet airliner, we really struggle. Two simple things account for most of it. One, we don't always test the techniques of high speed drag reduction in the appropriate flow regimes. And we don't necessarily use the shapes that we learned how to become efficient with at low speeds because when you carry a lot of weight and go really fast, the physics don't work out. It's the same conflict. Most airplanes reflect their underlying mathematical basis that flows from the configuration up. But good design flows from the math down. And the math that we use at the decision-making level is based on Cartesian simplifications of a complex three-dimensional, actually four-dimensional problem. Now, one day a few years ago, I learned something that led to an epiphany, and shortly thereafter to a whole class of airplanes that are unusually capable and efficient. This is version 32 of just one of them, one that would work for myself, my family, and my business needs. And I hopefully will light the path up for a solution for the transportation problem for man. It's called Synergy Prime, and it's a double box tail airplane. The wing tails that are above and behind the wingtips actually push down. This arrangement provides a whole bunch of unexpected advantages. Synergy is faster than a Bugatti Veyron, and it gets more than 40 miles per gallon. It can carry five to six people in pure comfort. People always ask me, does it scale up and scale down? Can you make it bigger or larger? And of course you can, but that's not the right idea. You know, the right idea is to invest the work in properly tailored solutions for each mission application. You see, when you arrange all of the priorities of advanced aircraft design in the right order, they amplify and build upon one another. We achieve symbiosis and synergy. This first advantage the configuration gives us is small. Its configuration is stability and control by means of drag reduction. The biggest benefit to target comes from a proven concept that's called active drag reduction. It's a way of using engine power not just to push ourselves through the air, but actually to reduce the drag. But that drives the bookkeepers crazy. So let me make it easier to understand. Old school airplane business is a little bit like old Bill and Clyde wandered into the arcade room one day. And they just dominated. They became the champs because they could add horsepower and add horsepower and add horsepower. But then one day, some guy walks in and puts a quarter in the machine and turns it on. And old Clyde says to Bill, I didn't think you could do that. Active drag reduction creates a zero drag condition, or near it. We're working to build a proof of concept scale model of this full scale right now with the aid of volunteers and engineers from all over the world. 
And I'd show you a little bit of that while I tell you another story. Did you know that after we learned how to fly, we still didn't quite know why? Around World War II, there were very different ideas about that, completely mathematically complete ideas. The Germans' theory of lift by fluid circulation had only one little problem. It was, technically, it was impossible. Whereas the British, theirs was just flat wrong, delivered the wrong information. And it was easily defended academically. Today, we never talk about this because it's like it's a tiny little footnote in history. But the same discussion still applies to drag. In fact, the air doesn't care about all our little silly frames of reference. It just responds. It moves in very simple, predictable ways. So even though it's a uh, proven experimental fact, it just necess wouldn't necessarily be proper to take that leap of faith and use what's proven in, in experiment. So after we've created optimum shapes using different principles, it's easy to analyze them, test them. Why don't we do that? Joshua Fields Milburn wrote that a Rolex won't give you more time. We only get so much of it. But an aircraft of this type is a time machine. Now, not long ago, my partner and I, John Paul Noyes, uh, flew from Spokane, Washington, back to the valley. And as soon as we got set, I realized I hadn't told my wife what time we'd be arriving. So, no, no, that's not a problem. F Spokane's a four-hour drive from here. But I realized as I looked at the map in the cockpit that we would be on the ground in Kalispell before she could drive across town to pick us up. Now, that was awesome. Well, Synergy uses six proven drag reduction principles not to create more world records, but to open the door to sustainable economics in regional transportation. At mere pennies per passenger mile, NASA says this is a trillion dollar market opportunity for the whole industry. By providing systematic efficiency in the design, Synergy might just deliver or become the catalyst to deliver an entirely new solution to this regional transportation problem. And hopefully, maybe someday, you'll be watching TED Talks, and some guy will come along and say, man, what did we ever do without smart planes? <laughs> you could live in a nice place. What Let's do you mean? more time with your family, and yet interact with people face to face all over the world. Thank you.